Hello, and welcome to an evidence-based approach to examining ascites, a video made in conjunction with the UC Davis School of Medicine. In this video, we'll give a quick overview of the evidence-based physical exam, discuss an evidence-based approach to physical diagnosis and assessment of ascites, and provide a video of a UC Davis Master Clinical Educator demonstrating high-yield physical exam maneuvers that every UC Davis graduate should know and the evidence behind them. Regular hand washing before and after each exam has been shown to reduce morbidity and mortality in the hospital and clinical setting. We've all been taught the four basic components of the abdominal exam, inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. And while these provide the foundation for our abdominal exam, today we'd like to discuss a different approach. An evidence-based approach to the physical exam begins with a diagnostic question. For example, does this person have chronic anemia? To answer the question, you first estimate a pretest probability, which is essentially your best guess as to how likely you think this patient is to have the pathology in question based on aspects of their history, presenting symptoms, etc. It's generally expressed as a percentage. Using this as your starting point, you choose an evidence-based physical exam maneuver, which depending on whether the test is positive or negative, will feed back on your original hypothesis, giving you a new post-test probability, as demonstrated in this figure. For example, if you don't think that your patient is anemic, giving them a, a pretest probability of 20%, but then you discover conjunctival pallor on exam, that really changes your thinking, giving you a much higher post-test probability. How much a given physical exam maneuver changes your pretest probability depends on the sensitivity and specificity of the test, which in this case is expressed as a function called the likelihood ratio. You can see in the figure how a positive or negative likelihood ratio can affect your pretest probability either a great deal, for example if you have a positive likelihood ratio of 10 or more, or barely at all. For example, a likelihood ratio close to one. Let's see how this applies to the patient we're evaluating for ascites. So we start by estimating our pretest probability, which is our best guess as to whether or not we think our patient has ascites, and how sure we are about this, expressed as a percentage. Now this is based on two things really. One is the prevalence of the condition in the community you're working with, and the other is any specific aspects of your patient's history, things like their age, the onset of symptoms, their past medical history, any associated symptoms that they're having. So this is illustrated really nicely in this table, which is taken from a single prospective study of about 1,500 patients at a VA hospital in North Carolina. Since older men make up the majority of the population they serve there, and rates of substance use are relatively high amongst veterans, there's already a fairly high prevalence of ascites in their population. They went through different symptoms and found which ones were most useful in either increasing or decreasing the probability of having ascites in their patients. Note that increased abdominal girth and recent weight gain were the symptoms that were most predictive of ascites with positive likelihood ratios of 4.2 and 3.2 respectively while the absence of any ankle swelling on history was the most useful in decreasing the chances that the patient had ascites. Another interesting thing about this trial was that they had interns, senior level residents, and attendings each evaluate all the patients, and they found that there was actually extremely good agreement between the overall clinical impression and diagnosis at all levels of training, again probably owing to good screening questions and the high prevalence of ascites in the population that they serve. This figure is taken from another study of 90 patients with ascites, and it illustrates again how pretest probability really influences your subsequent physical exam. The authors here compared the accuracy of two common exam maneuvers that we'll discuss shortly, shifting dullness and a fluid wave, in patients that either had an elevated prothrombin time or who did not. Now, I want you to notice that the predictive value of these tests in both ruling in and ruling out ascites changed drastically depending on the PT. For example, the presence of a fluid rave in a patient with an elevated PT has a positive predictive value of 96%, compared to just 57% if the PT is normal. 
Conversely, the absence of either of these physical exam maneuvers is not particularly useful in ruling out ascites in a patient with an elevated PT. You can see here in the chart that the positive predictive values are 0.48 and 0.29 respectively. But if the PT is normal and the physical exam signs are absent, you can virtually rule out ascites according to this study. Note you see the positive predictive values are 0.02 and 0.08. Now, an elevated prothrombin time is a finding commonly seen in advanced hepatic cirrhosis, which is often associated with ascites. We use it here as just an example of a factor within a patient's history that is going to create the lens through which you look at your physical exam and inform what physical exam maneuvers you perform and how you interpret them. Now, if a patient's past medical history was significant for ovarian cancer or heart failure or on their UA they had proteinuria, well, then those are also things that would make you take a second look to see if the patient had signs and symptoms of ascites. So once you've estimated your pretest probability, it's time to move on to the physical exam. And below are listed some classic physical exam maneuvers, along with their associated likelihood ratios, in assessing the patient with ascites. Let's start by discussing a positive fluid wave which has the highest positive likelihood ratio at 5.3, meaning if the sign is present, the patient is about 30% more likely to have ascites. Shifting dullness is another exam maneuver that's useful in assessing ascites. It's relatively sensitive with a negative likelihood ratio of 0.4. This exam maneuver relies on the fact that in a belly that's full of fluid, the air-filled bowel will rise to the surface creating an area of relative tympany along the midline, along with bulging and dullness to percussion along the flanks. Asking the patient to rotate switches the area of dependency and causes the fluid to shift, creating new areas that are dull to percussion. This exam maneuver will be demonstrated for you later on in the video. Below are the results of other commonly used exam maneuvers to assess ascites along with their positive and negative likelihood ratios as pulled from several studies. Note that peripheral edema, which has a very strong positive and negative likelihood ratio, came from the results of only one small study. It's also worth taking a moment to discuss the pedal sign, which has positive and negative likelihood ratios that are near one, making it a test that's not very useful in ruling in or ruling out ascites, and also a test that can be uncomfortable or embarrassing for patients. It's therefore recommended against doing this test and their regular assessment of ascites. So let's use McGee's evidence-based physical diagnosis calculator to see how some of these physical exam findings will change our thinking about the diagnosis of ascites. So we choose ascites from the drop-down menu. It gives us a pretest probability of around 30%, but remember this is going to be different based on the population you're working with and your patient's presenting symptoms, past medical history, etc. So Let's say that we do the fluid wave test and we're able to appreciate a positive fluid wave sign on our patient. Remember, that had a positive likelihood ratio of 5.3. So now, all of a sudden, we go from a pretest probability of 30% that this patient has ascites to over 70% for our post-test probability, which that significantly changes our thinking and our diagnosis. Another test we talked about having a pretty good negative predictive value was the absence of shifting dullness, which had a positive likelihood ratio of 0.4. So if you're 30% sure that your patient had ascites, you test for shifting dullness, you don't appreciate it, all of a sudden your post-test probability is now down near 15%, about half as sure as you were before. That's a pretty good test. Finally, I wanted to talk about the puddle sign. A test that is uncomfortable and embarrassing for patients. Remember, we said it had a positive likelihood ratio of 1.3. Now, that would take your pretest probability from 30% to just under 40%, subjecting your patient to quite a bit of discomfort for something that's going to change your thought about ascites by less than 10%. To conclude, let's talk about four take home pearls from today's video. First, remember that when you're estimating your pretest probability, the prevalence of a condition in the community you're working with and your patient's presenting symptoms and medical history factor heavily into what your pretest probability is going to be. And in the study that we looked at earlier with the VA patients, recent weight gain and recent increased abdominal girth, like their pants don't fit anymore, ended up being the most predictive of their patients having ascites. Second, take the time to learn how to do a good assessment for a fluid wave and get the help you need to do the exam properly as this is the most predictive exam maneuver for the presence of ascites.
Third, if you go back and look at the physical exam maneuvers that we discussed earlier in this presentation and compare their respective likelihood ratios, which were calculated from pooled studies and reported in McGee's evidence-based physical diagnosis, you'll notice that two commonly taught physical exam findings, bulging flanks and flank dullness, have positive likelihood ratios close to 1, meaning that they're not that useful in detecting ascites. However, their negative likelihood ratios are relatively significant, both around 0.4 meaning that the absence of these findings will help you rule out the presence of ascites. Finally, avoid performing the puddle sign in the regular assessment of ascites, as this is not shown to be useful and can be uncomfortable and or embarrassing for your patient.